Xanadu was the first hypertext project founded in 1960 by Ted Nelson. It aims to facilitate a type of media called hypermedia, which is non-sequential writing in which the reader can choose their own path through an electronic document. Xanadu uh, proposed ideas such as backlinks, document versioning, micropayments, and many other revolutionary ideas that are still relevant today. However, uh, unfortunately, Xanadu can be considered vaporware because it never really materialized. Where Xanadu didn't fail are the things that help technologists break out of what they take for granted and assume to be. Like that was mm. the most valuable sorts of things I took from reading Ted Nelson, his writings and, and his YouTube videos. I think the uh, the vision of human augmented intellect is so alluring that it's lasted for, what now, 70 years? And so maybe one day we'll have something that Ted Nelson envisioned in the future. Hey, this is Sri. I'm a YC alum and a research engineer focused on natural language processing for search. And this is Will. I'm a YC alum and independent researcher who's worked across e-commerce, cryptocurrency, and financial industries. Welcome to the Tech Meme, where we talk about the edge of technology and what we can build with it. An optimistic look at the road ahead. We're two guys discussing edgy, fringe, or overlooked technologies over a couple of drinks. Our show has four segments. First, we give a high-level outline of what the technology is. Second, we talk about what it can do today. Then we let our imagination take over and see how the world would change if the technology was readily adopted everywhere. Lastly, if we believe in this future, how can we take a position on it? We can't be experts in everything we cover, so if you've got insights on this topic, let us know in the comments. And be sure to check out our audio versions on Apple Podcasts or Spotify so you can go about your day as you listen. Uh, but first, in the spirit of chatting over a couple drinks, what are we drinking today? Uh, today, I'm drinking Khalifa Farms Cafe Oat Milk for baristas and oat milk lovers alike. Apparently, it foams well. So I'm told that it's actually quite tough to steam milk that is not regular milk. Uh, so that's why there is a special barista oat milk. Nice. Uh, I have Gator Light. <laughs> it is a Gatorade uh, <laughs> electrolyte drink. Supposedly Pedialyte Gatorade itself. combination? Yeah. So supposedly Gator, Gatorade itself is supposed to be a hydrating drink, but uh, instead they've turned it into basically a sugar water beverage. And so they now have to have a sub brand, which does the original premise of Gatorade. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's as if Gatorade and Pedialyte had a baby and had Gatorade Light, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Okay. So in light of that, Sri, uh, what are we going to be talking about this week? Uh, what, what has gotten you excited this week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This week is going to be a fun episode. We are talking about Xanadu. Xanadu, mm. Xanadu was the first hypertext project founded in 1960 by uh, Ted Nelson. It aims to facilitate a, a type of media called hypermedia, which is non-sequential writing in which the reader can choose their own path through an electronic document. Uh, Xanadu uh, proposed ideas uh, such as backlinks, document versioning, micropayments, and many other revolutionary ideas that are still relevant today. However, uh, unfortunately, Xanadu can be considered vaporware because it never really materialized. So this is a sort of retro future episode, which we've done in the past, where we're going to go into the vision of this project, what it aimed to do, and then maybe talk about what parts are still relevant and also uh, do a little bit of a, a retrospective about what went wrong, why did it not take over the world in the way that it proposed to. <laughs> Ha ha ha! A, a, a retro 
episode in the past with a retrospective. That's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so like uh, Xanadu was one of those uh, projects that I had heard about in passing because like when you look back in computer history, you'll hear whispers of it mentioned. And like many things, I don't look, I don't get to look into it in depth until I have to do the research for our episodes. And uh, it turns out that it's older than I thought. And it had uh, more ties and influences than I thought. And I think one of the strange things is that its vision being back in 1960s has not been fully realized even with the technology that we have today. So either we still don't have the technology available to fulfill its vision or its vision is so hazy and ambiguous that we could never fulfill it or any number of the combinations in between. And I guess that's one of the things we'll talk about today. Yeah, exactly. I think that it's a combination of both because it's not an entirely failed project in that you can see the echoes of Xanadu and its uh, vision being manifested in other software projects. It's very rarely cited as an influence. I think that it's a Mm -hmm. fairly obscure project. When we were researching uh, about it, I didn't see a lot of you know, talk. There's not a mailing list. There are not a bunch of enthusiasts who are big fans of it. Xanadu. It's sort of just this historical artifact. Uh, but you do see that people are uh, basically re-implementing and rediscovering a lot of the things that uh, it, it proposed. Uh, but first, I, I think we can. Well, we can go... w- would it be in the class of like the Memex because it influenced the whole? It was the root of a lot of the computing ideas that we have, especially of the internet today. But I don't think there's like mailing lists for the Memex, is there? Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, definitely the Memex. Uh, we're referring to um, Vannevar Bush's Memex, which uh, he he published in an article, a very famous article called "As We May Think." Uh, is very, very influential. You see a lot of people when they're making new note-taking tools and other so-called tools for thought uh, sort of allude to the Memex. This was an article that was written before the the computer, I think, or at least definitely before the personal well, computer. Yeah, the, definitely before personal computers. The computers were available in 1945. They were just uh, military government sort of institutions. They were not things that most people knew about, much less like were able to get their hands on. That, that didn't come until maybe a decade or two later. Yeah, so uh, it's, good, it's good that we talk about uh, Vannevar Bush's, as we may think, and the Memex, because Nelson, Ted Nelson, was inspired after reading it. Uh, he read it sometime in the 60s, and uh, basically, <clears throat> Xanadu is a offshoot or maybe a, a, a spiritual successor to the idea of this Memex, which is a device that helps uh, the reader basically collate an information from across different sources to help them understand uh, a particular topic that they're researching. And then also to become a device where you can write back to it. So you, you once you collect all your references for this topic that you're researching, then you can assemble it together into some kind of document, and then you can save it back to the Memex. Uh, that's what, what the Memex was proposing. Uh, Ted Nelson, inspired by this, basically created a vision for Xanadu, uh, and then tried to propose it at various academic institutions uh, as a uh, research endeavor. Uh, I think he was at Harvard and Brown and, and things uh, to realize this vision. And uh, then it didn't pick up steam. Uh, they ended up getting funded in the 1980s. Uh, but then, unfortunately, at that time, another hypertext system, one which we all know and love, the World Wide <laughs> Web, was right. uh, was getting started uh, by Tim Berners-Lee in CERN, at CERN. And, and then the sort of the rest is history. The web took over as the predominant hypertext system and Ted Nelson's Xanadu, which had a very, very comprehensive idea of what hypertext could be with two-way links, 
with this idea called transclusion, with many, many other ideas, micropayments, for example, all of that kind of get le- got left in the dust by the web, which was this very fragile uh, kind of half-baked uh, uh, version of hypertext, at least according to Ted, Ted Nelson. He's very resentful about this. Uh, well, I mean, one of the one of the things is just that the simple things work. Yeah, it's it's one of those instances of worse is better, which is a kind of phrase right. that people will toss around. Basically, even if the World Wide Web didn't have anything other than just simple one way links, at least it existed compared to to Xanadu, and so uh, that the rest is is history, as as we say. But mm-hmm. I do want to, before we go too deep, right. do, I do want right. to describe what Xanadu is. Uh, so and, and like what it's supposed to do and what problems it's supposed to solve, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So actually, there's a, there's a great article by Maggie Appleton, which we'll put in the show notes, uh, about what problems Xanadu is uh, trying to solve. But I thought it was a very good outline. Uh, basically... If you think about how we organize information, um, especially in a research context, uh, Xanadu is basically trying to address the problem of how do you how do you organize information such that it refers to each other and build relationships between information across a variety of documents, uh, which might be scattered in a variety of different sources, and and create a narrative right to clarify. Mm-hmm your understanding. And then there is another aspect of it which is how do you how do you credit the authors of those documents such that uh they can be rewarded and and make money from being highly cited. So if you put out something which people want to reference, how do you basically monetize that? That's a very interesting aspect of Xanadu which is baked into the Xanadu protocol and the pro- the Xanadu specification, which we still don't have on the web today. Mm-hmm. And then the other aspect of it is the idea of how do you refer to these different pieces of information across different documents and weave them together in a si- singular document such that there is a trail of references so that if you go to a particular document, you can see the refer- the backlinks. You can see the documents that are citing it, and then you can follow them, and uh, and so on and so on. So it's it's a very interesting notion of connectedness. Basically, rather than just having one-way connections where you have a link that takes you somewhere and that's that, you basically have this like weaving of documents together by this idea called transclusion, which is where rather than simply copy-pasting or screenshotting a piece of a document and then including it on your own. Um, instead, what you can do is you basically have a live reference to a span of text on on the target document. And that gets loaded at basically runtime, gets loaded as a live view. And so it's not like you're storing your own copy or you're, you're copy pasting the document. It's actually a kind of window into the document that you're referring to. And you, you can basically weave together uh, your own document by kind of transcluding bits and pieces from other documents as well as adding your own original content and uh, basically create this like um, these web pages that are kind of this pastiche, kind of a collage of, of different references. Right. And then you can dig through the palimpsest of the sources and their changes over time. And also, if somebody said something stupid, you can never let them forget it. <laughs> the the web <laughs> never let them forget it. Right. So so that yeah. that was the vision of, of the sort of problems it was trying to solve. Um, did you find it weird that uh, Ted never used the the any of the demos and it used to do any of his writing and thinkings? Because most of the stuff I've seen are like on photocopies or books or, or like, I guess like recently he publishes to the web and does YouTube videos, but like, I I haven't seen anything that he's. Yeah. You would think that if this was a radically useful tool for thought that being able to weave these references together. Yeah. Even just do like a, a minor version of it, like possibly could have been helpful. 
Right. And so rather than having a version of this that works across the entire uh, internet, if he just had his local copy of it and, and was able to demonstrate that it was useful to organize um, you know, information about Xanadu itself, that would have been maybe a more compelling demo than trying to go and proselytize this grand vision, right? If it's working for one instance, then maybe other people would have gone, hey, this is interesting. Let's try it for our own use case. And then uh, you could somehow network them together and and build the Xanadu incrementally that way. But I think that was never part of the sort of go-to-market strategy. I think yeah. it was very top-down, like, this is the grand vision, and then we're going to do it all at once rather than mm-hmm. this incremental way that you're describing. Yeah, and I, I guess the lean startup didn't quite exist in the 1970s, 65, 70s too. So, but, yeah. but in recent interviews, uh, like in the... 2021s he does mention things like the minimum viable product like those words came out of his mouth and so for a 30 something odd project like that's encouraging so maybe he'll get something out soon that people can play with so yeah well yeah let's hope um and then so then beyond the problems that it's trying to solve like what what are what are the things that it could do like uh, like I, i guess this is the part where we can show some of the demos and stuff so so like what are some things that i could do yeah so we will we'll put the visuals uh on the screen so if you're Mm -hmm. listening on audio check out our video version if you want to see what we're talking about or on youtube on youtube um yeah so i think some of the things that it can do are interesting one of which is the is transclusion as as i've mentioned um, it's it's really really interesting. I don't know how to describe it quite in words. It's like em- embeds, you know. Like we're all familiar now with the idea of you can take like a tweet, for example, and then mm-hmm. paste it into uh, a document editor like Notion, and it'll expand that from just being a link to you can see the copy of the tweet, or you can right. see the copy of a YouTube video. It can be embedded in the document itself. And so we have this concept of embeds that are is becoming more popular now, but that's the idea of transclusion, which is that you can basically do embeds of just any arbitrary span of text, any paragraph, any sentence from any Xanadu document and sort of embed it in your own document. Right, except you would never 404 on that because somehow it would retain a local, either a local or remote copy of whatever version of the span of text that you were quoting in your own document. Um, and in addition, whoever you're quoting from would get a list of everybody that are co- quoting them. So that's that kind of bi-directional nature of these transclusions and links that, that are kind of tied into the concept. Yeah. And so I think that's interesting because bi-directional links are a new concept or rather they are having a new renaissance with note-taking tools like Rome Research, which if you haven't watched our video on it, we have a a video, our very first season one, episode one video. Uh, So check that out. Way back when. Way back when. (laughs) But um, I think that is catching on among a certain niche set of people who are using it to organize their own thoughts because maybe when you're referencing a concept you want to refer to that concept but then you also when you when you're looking at the note for that concept you want to see all of the other uh, instances where it's referred to it's a way to organize your thoughts both like from like from two different perspectives i guess i think the problem i had with previous note-taking tools was that I never knew where to put the notes because all the note-taking tools I had forced me to create a label or a project or a notebook or like some container for the note before I 
was ready to put them in because when you're browsing around the web or you're doing research, it's kind of free form or free floating. Like things might remind you of stuff, but you're not sure how the pieces all fit exactly. There's the step of reviewing your notes, which is the part where you synthesize all these things together. And that's where the bi-directional comes in. I can review it and then try to synthesize its commonality to see some sort of pattern. Bi-directionality is really useful in that sense. So that's just something a little mm -hmm. bit more concrete um, as to like how it would help in note-taking, tools for thought, or a thinking tool. And as it would work yeah. across the entire web, I, I think one of the visions for Xanadu is that you can do this collectively together in a giant global brain. Of course, there are issues <laughs> with trolls and stuff like that, but right. I guess the, the high-level vision is that you're able to do this sort of stuff together. Yeah, and I think that you brought up something very interesting, which is that we kind of have an instance of this through Twitter. People oh, are right. using Twitter not just for kind of social media, but they're also using it to write original content, write uh, these threads. And then there's an interesting pattern, which maybe you can speak more about, in which you can basically transclude threads into each other and create this like weaved uh, reference network of, of threads, which is kind of Xanadu-like. It is. like Some people use it like that. Depending on who you f choose to follow, you may, may or may not see this behavior. And so uh, for those of you that may not curate your Twitter, but, uh, there are people that uh, try to get their ideas out via Twitter, but in, instead of, say, a blog post, because it has distribution built in. And so they would structure it as a thread of small tweets that are all replies to each other. And they would start the first one as a thread, and then there would be the emoji of a spool of thread, <laughs> one of N or one of five or however many you expect to read. And then going down that line, they would have a, a singular linear train of thought. But at any point, if one of those uh, tied into a previous thread that they mentioned, then they would include a Twitter link to that. Or in Xanadu terms, they would transclude it. And and then that would give you another th line of thinking or thread to to go through. And oftentimes people like linked back to their own threads because that's the most reliable. But, you know, you could conceivably link to other people's Twitter threads and then you would have this web of ideas that you could traverse. And that is is what we're talking about that that is in line with uh, what what a, a particular version of Xanadu uh could be that that is along the lines of like a public network of thinking yeah exactly there's a great article we'll include in the show notes called the spread of threading which gives some instances of twitter accounts which do this type of thread writing as well as interlinking of threads they use this pattern extensively so if you're not following people on this corner of twitter you can take a look at some of the examples here and I think it's a good point. A lot of people use this to refer to their own ideas and kind of build an incremental network of interlinked ideas. But the cool thing about Twitter is that it has distribution built in, meaning that you can find other people's threads and then refer to them in your own. And so it is this interlinked two-way linking between uh, ideas from different people which is the one of the main features that Xanadu was trying to strive for. And I do think that it is a very effective way to consume and publish information. On Twitter, if you follow the right people, you can learn a lot of interesting things, and you can find out other uh, interesting concepts and topics and explications of things based on who they basically transclude. Uh, on Twitter, the transclusion works by... Um, by putting the Twitter link or I think mm -hmm. quote tweeting. So quote tweeting is basically a type of transclusion, uh, but it's this basically the same concept. And I, th I find it pretty effective. I, I learn a lot uh, on Twitter. I find it to be an interesting way to discover information. And if that's what Ted Nelson was going for, 
with Xanadu, I can see why this was a very compelling idea. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> once again, like somebody should make a Twitter clone and just focus on that part of of Twitter and it might do very well if you get the right people on there. So that is once again the Technium Startup Idea Foundry. So one of our listeners <laughs> Please go build that. Somebody, we're sitting here like, yeah, somebody else should do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Whereas every time in our post or pregame, I'm like, why, why don't we do? Oh, why don't we do any of those? Are they bad ideas? No, they're good ideas, but I don't know that we want to do them. <laughs> that yeah. says to me that that they're not bad ideas. We we wish that somebody else would do it for us. So <laughs> yes, well, you know, we should we should uh, do some angel investing as well. Right? <laughs> right, if, right. If you're building this, we'll invest in it. <laughs> we'll, exactly. Um, but I think with the idea of transclusion and bi-directional links, the other aspects of Xanadu that are built into the protocol are the idea of immutability and, and versioning. So one of the big problems with the web uh, is link rot. When mm. you have a link on a page, especially if it's an old web page or oftentimes an academic institution web page, you click this and you know that this link is going to is going to be more often than not broken. Like yeah. I have this sort of sixth sense. Like if I see a URL, I'm like, yeah, this is probably going to be broken because <laughs> <laughs> there's just something. There's a vibe to these links, um, and and it's a big problem actually. When when we were researching this uh, uh, this podcast, I found ref- references on Hacker News to some articles about Xanadu. And then when I clicked through to them, the web pages were down. And so I felt this like very, very uh, personally as it relates to this, this podcast. And the nice thing about Xanadu is that it kind of tries to avoid this because you can imagine if you have these interweaved web pages with transclusions and then a copy has gone down while well, the whole thing starts to lose its value. And so it's baked in this idea that documents are immutable and they're stored redundantly so that they uh, maintain the availability of content that's not dependent on just the whoever published that document to maintain its own copy. And uh, I think the other interesting part is that they built in, or, or, or Ted Nelson specifically was advocating for versioning so that when the co- copy of the source document was updated, it wouldn't break the transclusions because it would be updated on a different version and the previous transclusions would still be able to have a stable reference to whatever they were originally referring to. When you mention all this, like this really strongly reminds me of IPFS and its ilk. I mean, there's Arweave, and I think the Ethereum Foundation also has a similar project. Is it like Ethereum Swarm or something? I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like this is not technically easy stuff. And if, it took those guys years. I mean, not not like years in Xanadu years, but it, <laughs> it was still like five to six years before they, they got something out. And this is like working software now, but it took them a little while. And so no maybe like i there was there's not a lot of technical information available for zandu i think that's one thing that's hard to evaluate and so we can kind of go mostly only go off of its principles rather than its implementation um but what little that we were able to find i saw no mentions of the typical technologies that are used in ipfs and are we even it's it's similar like even just like cryptographic hashes are almost never mentioned right yeah and yeah. so i do wonder if like they were just i don't know they just didn't have either the heart i mean one thing is they didn't have the hardware like they were trying to build this in the 1970s Maybe that's one issue. And and also they didn't have, I don't know, when was like all the cryptographic stuff invented? I, I think, think it was in the 70s the also, 70s right? 70s and but, 80s, yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't popularized until a little bit later. And so I wonder if they just didn't have the software tools to be able to do this stuff more easily either. And that's why it took such a long time. Um, yeah. But but yeah, that's that's immediately what what kind of came to mind when we were you were talking about the link rot and stuff like that. These aren't easy problems to solve at scale, 
And so maybe that's part of the reason why that we got the web that we did because mm-hmm. that was the part that we could do. Yeah, it's it's a good point that the I think the reason why you when you read the Xanadu protocol and specifications and whatnot, it doesn't go into the detail of these things like cryptographic hashes or cryptographic signatures and things that you might want to uh, use to verify the integrity of this content and and things like this. I think actually the main reason is that a lot of these uh, cryptographic primitives were classified information. They were uh, invented in the 80s. And they were not fully declassified slash publicly available for uh, consumer use until the late 90s, I believe. Uh, I think my phrase of to be fair to Xanadu was it, is that um, in some ways it's divorced from the implementation so that it can concentrate on what's wholly possible. Because I know that as an engineer and person that has to design a product it's hard to separate one from the other because as an engineer you're like oh this is going to be so hard but you can't let that influence you when you're making product right so you almost have to like disassociate the two and (laughs) and i think xanadu does a very good job of disassociating (laughs) no i mean that that's not a very kind way to put it no, I mean that that's that I mean like you you if you're held back by today's technology limitations then you can never actually dream about the future. I I, I think that that's fair, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so so I think it, to to that point that's why in some ways even today Xanadu is futuristic. It's beyond what we have today currently as advances as our technology is so i think that's part of the reason why yeah right and so one of the things when i say like the vision of xanadu is divorced from its implementation being a good thing like when i when people talk about the memex they rarely mention the fact that it's pictured and described as a desk like a wooden desk with microfiche coming out of it on each side and it sounds really quaint to us because we're like oh we 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 can kind of envision this digitally like we don't need microfiche fiche and stuff like that but like in order for people at the time to make it a practical implementation to be able to transfer that vision to other people they have to make it concrete by using the technology of the day but when you look at the technology of the day and try to like map it back onto the technology today, you're like, ah, a lot of this stuff just doesn't make sense or doesn't work, right? And so that tends to obscure the vision. Whereas if like the vision and the implementation were actually divorced and you were actually able to convey the vision without the implementation of the day, especially if it requires technology from the future, you're probably much better off without it. And so so that's what I mean. Like I mean it in the very most positive, optimistic way about Xanadu that like I think the vision, if you can communicate it without the burden of today's implementation, then all the more power to you. <laughs> that so that that's effectively the the thing I was trying to get across there. Yeah, I see what you mean. I saw this quote which basically said that Ted Nelson and Xanadu are playing in the realm of platonic ideals. Oh, so yeah. if you if you kind yeah. of get the philosophical reference where right. the, the there's trying to build this vision for a perfect system which does all of the right things. And I think that there's a lot of good things in there. Immutable content micropayments, two-way linking, all of these are powerful ideas. Now, throughout the last several decades, a few of those have become possible. A few of these are still kind of on the cutting edge, but this didn't concern Ted Nelson. He was thinking about the ideal system. And um, and I think that's getting at what, or what you're getting at, which is this divorce between the logical concept and then the physical implementation 
Uh, it seems like the ideas from Xanadu are kind of timeless in the fact that they're divorced from any type of reality, yeah. any type of mechanics of how it works. Like if you go read right. about it, it's completely underspecified, but that adds to the allure, I think. Right. But then on the other hand, like we, I guess we'll talk about this later. That's also it's it's uh, Achilles heel because it's hard to do any sort of implementation when everybody's heads in the clouds and they're all in different clouds, but nobody knows it. Like we're all on different pages, but nobody knows it. Yeah. So, so that 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 like if you ever read, uh, I mean, like the Wired uh, w- article on it back in 1995, it details some of that. Definitely, it's a little bit dramatic, and but it details the life of the Xanadu project and the multiple times it came to near death and to death. And so, so um, you'll, you'll see a lot of what we're talking about here in the segment in that article. So we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, But yeah, just to wrap it up uh, for the, the immutable content and things, I think it's just now becoming possible with things like IPFS, but it's still not prevalent. And so um, it's interesting that, that was a, a fundamental part of Xanadu, which is just now being solved. So it's, it makes sense why, you know, really, really couldn't come to fruition until, you know, maybe just now. And then I, I think another part, the last part, which I found w- was really interesting about Xanadu was that uh, it had payments uh, baked in. Payments mm. as well as an attribution model slash copyright model, which they called trans copyright. Uh, which was basically this idea of if you have hypertext documents which are referencing each other and and you're actually including transcluding uh, bits and pieces from different documents, how do you ensure that you credit the original sources? Credit them both in an intellectual property way, uh, saying that this is the original source uh, and and so it's not plagiarism. You're actually properly attributing the source document, and then also crediting them potentially financially. So in Xanadu, there was this idea that when you put up a document, you can basically put up a micro paywall, which says if you want to view this document or when you transclude this document, the viewer pays a small payment in order to load the transclusion. And so... I thought that was interesting because this is still an unsolved problem on the web. We don't have a really robust, widely used micropayment system. You mm-hmm. see paywalls uh, put up most frequently on like news sites and things, but yeah. those are not micropayments. Those are, please subscribe to our membership so that you can view this content. Uh, but I think the way that Xanadu Im- imagined it would be quite seamless so you Mm -hmm. would pay you know fractions of a penny or maybe a few pennies or whatever to view that one little embed you don't need to sign up for a patreon or substack or whatever this is all just seamlessly happening uh, and everybody is getting credited for their ideas uh, up to whatever they the market will bear and um, I, I thought that was an interesting model for monetization and I also thought that was interesting because when you look at a lot of the original um, computing pioneers, they were not very interested in commerce and these these sort of mundane uh, aspects of of human life. I, I think the, like the, the, the <laughs> to the, their detriment. I think, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think that um, early computing was this utopian vision of everybody sharing freely, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that was interesting of Xanadu that it baked in the idea that, hey, maybe people want to get paid for putting content up and and made it a fundamental primitive within their system. Yeah, I say to their detriment because like the economics of things is how you most commonly materialize things into the real world. It's kind of the water that's around us, the the capitalist system in which you can actually materialize ideas into something that people will use in their day-to-day life it has to fit into whatever unit economics is going on for your particular space or industry and so when you ignore that i mean if 
it happens to get popular, you're going to be ill-equipped to handle it and you get patchwork of stuff later. And so I think in the same way, internet didn't really think too much about like the social implications and you got eternal Septembers and I guess we did all right. Uh, maybe you could argue that. And then we didn't really think about payments or security that much. And so we just kind of suffered through a lot of security breaches and I guess the world is still turning. Yeah. But I, I guess you could argue that, you know, maybe a little bit of forethought would have kind of smoothed things out a little bit more. That's not to say that you can pre-plan everything. Of course you can't, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but just, uh, I think, understanding how you bring things into the marketplace would have probably helped a little. Yeah. So payments is interesting because it's another instance of problems that are just now capable of being solved. I think that the internet didn't really have robust payment rails until maybe 15-ish years ago. Uh, where mm, What year would that be? Uh, you know, like maybe like in the mid-2000s mid or so, like where like with, with PayPal was probably the most prevalent oh, I see what you're saying. You know, yeah, yeah, uh, payment yeah. system. And then I think with Stripe, and other uh, sort of more recent things, you start to see more and more, you know, small businesses or things like Gumroad or Substack yeah, being possible. But but people did use credit cards on the web in the '90s. Otherwise, eBay would not have been such a huge company. But then I yeah. guess eBay only made it big because like they were able to piggyback off off of uh, PayPal. Yeah. So yeah. like. Yeah, I, I guess I could buy that. I could buy that. Yeah, and and even things like payouts. So in marketplaces, when you have two-party uh, systems, a lot of the time the marketplace processes the payment and then distributes the payments out through uh, the traditional banking system uh, in the U.S. It would be something like ACH, which would mm -hmm. uh, deposit money into bank accounts. And I yeah. think a lot of those things, maybe they're technically possible, all along, but the uh, libraries and, and things that made those really readily available and, and the patterns uh, took a while to be established. This is probably another obstacle to Xanadu being fully realized was that we didn't have even regular payments, not to mention micropayments, right? Yeah. Micropayments are still not even really a thing. The idea that you can load a web page and then have small trickles of money yeah, being sent to hundreds of people. I mean, sometimes you can still I, do that. Sometimes I wonder if that's like a solution searching for a problem or like I just can't tell with, with that particular <laughs> thing or if it's something that people, the publishers actually want, but like no consumer actually wants it. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I but, don't know. Nobody's really clamoring to pay money when they load web pages. I will say that. <laughs> I, I think most <laughs> people prefer to have free web pages. But I think what's, interesting is that that's of course created this ads driven business mm -hmm. model for right. the web which we've fallen into and people mm -hmm. do complain about that they complain about ads they complain about targeting and the privacy issues etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. now will anybody actually put their money where their mouth is and want to pay for content on the web maybe not it doesn't seem like there's a huge demand for that but I do think it's interesting that like if if Xanadu had succeeded and there was this method of micropayments, maybe we wouldn't have a this ads ads driven model for the web. Mm. Yeah, actually I was thinking like this we can talk about later in the second third order effects, but maybe a way that people would be willing to pay for the content is micropayments on bundles in the same way that people pay for cable now you get like a bundle of channels and so one of the reasons why you get these esoteric channels in your cable bundles like uh i don't know like say an all public channel or something i don't know they, yeah. they have weird channels on there is because simply because they're bundled on it and mm -hmm. so so maybe something similar could happen yeah yeah anyways we'll we'll, we'll get to that later later in the show the other thing that I want to, to to plug and give a nod to when we're talking about micropayments is that it's just now becoming possible uh, due to technologies like 
uh, Bitcoin Lightning, which we have an episode about. So check oh, that right. out. Um, yes, check out our previous uh, episode on the Lightning Network. We're, yes, so so that is maybe a solution to this micropayments problem because in in the Lightning Network, you can send arbitrarily small amounts of money across um, across the the internet without incurring fees, and so it it is potentially a solution to uh, this this attribution problem that Ted Nelson was trying to solve. Mm, I see. Mm, given all the pieces that we talked about, from like the the distributed nature of the documents, the linking and the payments, like that's a that's a lot of work. <laughs> I I would be surprised if if they were able to get it to work in the time slot with the software and the hardware that. Maybe it's one of those things that is inevitably futuristic enough that uh, it, it takes a long time to come to fruition. Um, just a reminder that if you're still with us and you like what you're hearing about Xanadu, uh, the retro future of the web, as well as other ideas that we've been referencing, be sure to like this video and subscribe as well. We have a ton of other interesting concept that uh, you might be interested in taking a listen to. Uh, so That's with right. that, uh, I think that we've talked a lot about what the vision of Xanadu is and the good parts, the bad parts, the struggles, etc. I think the interesting part is what if Xanadu had succeeded? What would the world look like? What are the second and third order effects of some of these ideas? Ah, and the, the our fun part of the, the segment. The fun I guess. part. This is the best. This is the best part <laughs> where um, we can't be held to account to any of the BS that we pull out of our ass. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, uh, and and I think that Xanadu is a fun one because it gives a lot of fodder for us to to kind of make things up and imagine. Uh, partially in in part because Xanadu itself is sort of making things up as well. So it's uh, it's unfalsifiable, right? Anything is possible with Xanadu. <laughs> <laughs> like Zombocom? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which we'll, we can link that to the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's a throwback <laughs> reference. <laughs> right. Um, but I think that one vision that Xanadu was trying to realize was this idea of a hypermedia. I thought this was interesting because when we say things like hypertext or hyperlinks in our day-to-day -day parlance, they just sort of mean like text that you click it and uh, you get taken to some other document. And that is okay, right? But it's not a like mind-blowing concept. I think it's a, an interesting concept. And, and also... Ted Nelson refers to this type of linking that we ha have on the World Wide Web. Uh, he refer he refers to it sort of condescendingly as jump links. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you look at a lot of his videos, as and so clearly to deep linking, yeah, deep linking, bidirectional linking, etc. Yeah, and so I think that that shows that the way that he was thinking about linking or or hypertext is something much more fundamental. I think that Ted Nelson was imagining that by being able to have a medium in which you're able to compose documents through these references and also given a document, see who's referencing it, by having this sort of networked thought, it would become a new type of medium uh, similar to a, a new fundamental type of medium like film uh, or, or the photograph. And I'm not quite sure exactly what that would look like or feel like because we don't really have it. But I think that he was imagining that this would create a new type of way of composing narratives or spreading information that's different than simply serializing ideas onto a page. Well, I mean... Uh... We get kind of hints of it. I guess if you use those uh, Rome research notebooks at all, it'd be like that, but public or like Twitter threads. But 
it would be the same as your note taking tool, something right. like that. Um, but then I, I guess what what I imagine this hypertext as a new type of media is that it would it would be like the web in the sense that it just exists and it's out there, but. I can write to it immutably. So like I, I don't update anything in place. I just overlay a new version on top. I think I imagine the hypertext as a medium uh, in the same way that the web is just all sort of out there. And all you have to do to plug into this trove of data is that you log on with some app and you look at it and I can't imagine it having different decorations or CSS in the same way that the web does now, but maybe everything just looks like a Twitter thread Mm. and you can, and it would be like those Twitter apps in which you can have multiple threads going on at the same time. And you're trying to make connections in, in which Twitter or this like web of Twitter threads is both your source of information where you go to instead of Hacker News, but also your authoring tool. So it's kind of like a weird juxtaposition of where you write is public at the same time. And we don't have anything like that because I think most people don't like working in public Mm -hmm. um, because of... Well, nobody likes to say stupid things and reads like, right? And especially if this is an immutable system, then your stupid thoughts get perpetuated and and comes back to slap you in the face a decade or two later, right? Um, Yeah. So I I don't know. I'm kind of imagining something like that as a medium. And then I guess whenever a new medium comes up, definitely I think people explore it. And definitely one of the avenues is that educators try to figure out like, what it's good for and i can see that it's it might provide a more self-directed learning because like you find that a lot of knowledge is interconnected in a way like subjects in school are only delineated that way artificially so we can grasp onto a core concept and things that are directly related to it but i think the more that you learn the more that you can see that the ideas, if not the people, are actually interrelated to a lot of like interdisciplinary things. Right. And so that might be right for self-directed learning or in the case of guided AIs, you could build something like a, a young ladies and Chiridian from Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age. Uh, have you mm-hmm. heard of that? Yeah, do, I have. Do you, <laughs> Um, I don't read a lot of science fiction, but I guess that's one of the few that I did. It's basically like a a book in which uh, it's the content is catered to the reader at the age that they're at. And so you would have um, characters in the book that teach different concepts like reading, writing, arithmetic. And then as you grow older, it would like grow with you and Mm. teach you different things. And so you could imagine something like that with an AI on this web of Twitter threads that's completely public, but that's also your yeah. self-authoring tool in which you eventually contribute your own thoughts to it. That that That's kind of what I can imagine. And then eventually also, as it matures it, as a medium, politicians will try to use it to influence the thoughts of the masses in some way, right? Yeah, inevitably. What, <laughs> right. Whether they create like a web of interrelated things so it becomes an idea maze that you can never get out of. So you think that that's what is actually true. But like if you right. manage to find your way out, you can find the other side of the argument. So maybe that's one way that 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 uh, hypertext as a media gets leveraged as a tool for politics. Like it, kind of in the same right. way that, that it's done nowadays. But instead of logic... Oh, uh, I think nowadays it's more a tool to ferment emotional decision making. I guess mm. as politics always is, I guess to appeal to emotions. Yeah, that's interesting because there are these idea mazes. If you fall into the right rabbit holes, or maybe the wrong rabbit holes, on the internet, 
you can find this nest of people referencing each other's ideas. Yeah, self-enforcing too, right? Yeah, exactly. And so you do see some of that through the hypertext that we have, but I can imagine that it, if you have something like Xanadu, it would really amplify both the good and the bad. Yeah, so I mean, like I, I think like all, all the stuff that I just kind of said, I'm grabbing as an analogy to the things that I'm seeing today already. So like, so then I guess I wanted to dig a little bit deeper as to like why it was a little bit hard for you to imagine like what a hypertext is a new type of media would look like. Yeah, so I've actually thought a bit about this and realized that the reason why I was having a, a hard time imagining what, what hypertext is, is that if you read Xanadu and you read Ted Nelson's work, it's all quite academic in that the idea, the purpose of Xanadu is for research and for these high-minded oh, things. I see. I Whereas, see. It's, it's mostly focused to the, like, in the same way that, like, the original web was for researchers to exchange papers with each other, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, but that's so, not what the majority of us are doing all the time. I mean, I think both you and I are... Cat you know, photos, for, right? Yeah, <laughs> cat yeah. videos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and we're, we're pretty nerdy. Like, we run a podcast about the history of technology <laughs> right. and whatever. But, right. like, it's not like I'm all in my free time always, like, trying to scour the internet for new and esoteric types of knowledge. A lot of the time, I'm just, like, spending my time... Uh, trolling the good citizens of the net <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> uh, and i think that that even if if you go to the more you know average person in the population i think that's how they typically engage with technology as well and so i was having a hard time imagining what hypertext would be as a medium because i was thinking about this from almost this ivory tower mindset Whereas if you think about most media, even things like video and music and, and photos and things like that, when they become popular, they become popular due to the fact that they're fulfilling some more, I don't know, base elements of, of human nature. Just like I would say common. For, yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah, common. Maybe not, yeah. not base. That, that, although <laughs> there's some of that as well. But yeah, uh, but yeah I think like that's, that was the disconnect. But then I was thinking I a little bit more, I, a few months ago, I had this this thought, which wasn't in the context of Xanadu, but now makes a lot of sense in the context of Xanadu, which is that TikTok is a form of hypermedia. Have you used TikTok? I tried to stay away from it. I've, I've seen it and I went down this rabbit hole and I didn't even have an account. I'm like, how it's it's too effective at what it does. It's very, very effective at what it does. Um, to give uh, our listeners an idea of what TikTok is, the surface level is that it's short form video. And the sort of dismissive uh, viewpoint of, of TikTok is that it's just silly dances and skits and, and uh, you know, these mundane things. But actually, if you start to use TikTok more and more, it has an algorithm which really understands uh, your interests and presents to you exactly the content that you might be interested in. Uh, that, that was my experience if you use it for, for a few days. And, but that's not, <laughs> but that, I guess then people, people um, discover who they really are through their clicks rather right. than who they actually aspire to be because those aren't in their actions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's that's true. <laughs> so if you get crappy TikTok videos, it's that's the you. mirror. St yeah, <laughs> that's the mirror reflecting back at you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so that's an algorithmic aspect. But one thing I found interesting as I started to get past the surface level silly dances and things, I started to find that there were pockets of TikTok that were talking about um, hobbies and things that I was generally interested in, like cooking and fitness mm. and, and whatnot. And there was an interesting use of video as a medium on TikTok because TikTok has this distribution mechanism built in and you can discover people's other people's content quite easily. What I found that people were doing was they were using uh, elements of TikTok or features that TikTok provided 
as a way of transclusion and creating a hypermedia. So TikTok provides these primitives in which you can reference other people's videos. So oh, you can do yeah, things like yeah. duetting, which means uh-huh. that you have the original video and then you right. are sort of overlaid next to them and you're talking yeah. and giving commentary. Right, um, they right. have things called stitching where you can take a, a splice of a video and then splice it into your own video and then maybe expound yeah, on videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you could do that uh add what's the latin word for into infinity like, like ad, you, ad nauseum or yeah, yeah ad or nauseum ad or whatever right yeah. right and so you can kind of keep going and people have created really i guess humorous tiktoks um yeah. and videos as a result of this thing and i had not thought about it as linking but in the context of transclusion it definitely is a kind of link yeah yeah that's mm-hmm. that's really interesting yeah and and, and it's not just you know, t- taking a uh, clip of the video, a lot of the time on TikTok, you can follow through and you can find the original video as well. It maintains a reference to the original video. And so you do get this attribution model uh, that Transclusion provides uh, through Xanadu. And I thought it was very interesting because you can create entertaining pieces of uh, uh, humor this way. And people use it for humorous yeah. effect. I think people also do... And the humor, commentary. the humor is through the transclusion. It's it's through right. the link itself. It's it doesn't make sense when you just have one thing or the other. It's right. through the relationship of the thing that makes it humorous, right? Yes, exactly. And so it's it's baking in the idea that it's taking for granted that you can do transclusion and using that to elevate and accomplish things that wouldn't otherwise be possible with just normal video as a medium. I think that was really interesting because one of the things when you mentioned like a uh, new type of media was hypertext, like I thought like, oh, like Ted Nelson and Xanadu didn't really think about video all that much. But like, what if you had hyper videos? And originally I was just thinking of like having clips and cuts of clips. But like now that you mentioned TikTok, I'm like, oh, yeah, like there's just way more that you can actually do with this. And like the type of things that like you don't have to like. It's not like, quote, like, I was just thinking that you would have a clip in the same way that a lot of times people overlay clips while they're talking in YouTube mm-hmm. videos, or maybe you get a picture in picture, like a newscast or something like that. But you're totally right that for something like a hyper video, I guess we can coin the term if nobody else has done <laughs> it already. Yeah. But like uh, TikTok already does that. It's just that it's on a proprietary network. <laughs> And and instead of being a decentralized web, and so it's the relationship of the links that makes the content meaningful. Which, unlike mm-hmm. the web's links, it's it's more light than than like what uh, hyper video links would be. The other major uh, downstream effect of Xanadu, if it were to take over, is what I mentioned before, which is an alternative business model for the internet besides ads. One of the effects of the fact that the internet was just put out there and people had to figure out commerce and payments and things like that after the fact was that I think initially the web was this purely academic environment. And then people were like, hmm, how can we make money on this? And it's inevitable that given anything, any new technology, people will want to monetize it and use it to make money for commerce. And the best way that people were able to figure this out was advertising. I think partially due to necessity because web browsers, like I mentioned, for for at least several years didn't have security built in. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't transmit payment data securely. And then even when they had security built in, there was no payments built into the browser. There was no payments yeah. API, so to speak. You So people had to figure out um, ways to transmit payments. And and all of this is quite cumbersome. So the, probably the, the easiest way to figure out monetization was just to do it centrally on the back end and say, we're going to have these ads networks and they're going to, to put ads, uh, banner ads or display ads on web pages and we'll just monetize that way, right? We won't have to bother the consumer with 
subscriptions and payments and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And that became the de facto monetization uh, strategy for the entire internet. But I think things are changing now um, because I think the public has much more awareness. I think 25% of users use ad blockers. Uh, so I think that's a significant portion of, of the population, which is frustrated with ads. I think there are rec regulatory changes with things like GDPR, mm -hmm. which are re reducing the effectiveness of advertising, targeted advertising as a business model. And I think I get the sense that uh, major services like Twitter, for example, are toying with this idea of what if we could monetize uh, directly from consumers. And so I think that Xanadu provides a compelling vision for how a non-ads-driven payment model for the internet could work. This is also in line with one of your startup ideas that we mentioned in a previous episode. I think two, two or three times, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Which one was, is that? I, I want to say episode one or two, and then, well, we've done so many that I, like it ceases, like I, it escapes me now. Oh, just the. I think it takes the form of when I talk about like a neural network of people in a company, and you have attributions that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but like Xandy Two is similar in that sense, but instead it's it's not attribution of work, but rather just uh, well, I guess attribution of the output of work, assuming everybody's just writing for work. Right, 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 right. Okay, so I, I, I know what you're saying. So when you're saying neural network of, of, of work, you're referring to the back propagation algorithm, right, which, right. which attributes value to the the neurons in a neural network based on their effect that they have on the output of the, right. of the network. And so and, in a company, if the output is like profitability, then if you're able to attribute the the work or the output to every worker where every worker is a neuron, then perhaps you could do that. Yeah. And we've mentioned it a couple of times and I, th I think I, I frame it as this like money repl where you, you mm -hmm. post things on this oh, like right. repl type uh, right, 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 environment right. and then you can somehow make money by uh, like somebody recognizing the value of your contributions mm -hmm. to this global knowledge graph and things like this. Right. Yeah. And to bring it back to Xandu, they explicitly um, tied into this transclusion mechanism in which you can attribute work. And every time you use it, um, you pay, like viewers pay money for, for viewing it and whatnot. And I guess yeah. like if we were to kind of sh graft it onto the current Twitter threads now, I guess it's kind of like if you want to view this tweet on this thread, pay mm. 0 0.001 cent or something like that. Yeah. I imagine that if it was an active decision where I always had to decide, do I want to see this thing or not, it would be very high friction. I almost feel like you would just want to have the money flow uh but then you would have to have some type of mechanism such that you to know, cut you off, right? <laughs> to cut you off, and such that nobody prices their tweets at like a hundred dollars, and then my browser is like you know spending a hundred dollars to render like one Twitter thread or something. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I think if it was some reasonable, if there was some bound on there, right, and I, and there was some metering such that I knew that I wasn't spending you know hundreds and hundreds of dollars just to view content on online. Um, I think that it could be interesting because, yeah, people are putting in the work and uh, creating great content. And also they're creating content that has downstream effects. Like a lot of the way that Twitter threads work, somebody will write a very interesting or provocative Twitter thread and then other people will transclude that and then start to take have their own take. Maybe they'll refute it. Maybe they will add some other um, additional information. But it, there are these kind of viral threads which can basically start this conversation, start a conversation that was not happening. And that is a valuable type of work, and it would be good for somebody who starts that type of conversation, assuming it's a productive conversation, to be rewarded, right? Because they've now created this discussion which is presumably a good thing. 
like these guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But but then do you wonder if the hard part of that whole supply chain of information is the distribution dissemination and hence like the focal point and the money will flow towards the aggregators and the distributors of that information or like whatever recommendation mm. engine for that. Right. And so we would end up back in the same place that we were before with like yeah. a concentrated – you get what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 I get what you're saying. Yeah, no, that's a good point because, yeah, maybe that's maybe that is the case, right? Like the the money pools where like value is being added, and yeah. I think if you were to uh, follow uh, you know, Stratechery uh, and um, oh, you know, Ben right. Thompson's we'll, like we'll aggregation put it in the, theory, yeah, we'll put aggregation theory in the show notes. <laughs> we'll I guess. We'll put it there. Yeah, yeah. So so. So according to aggregation theory, the value is being provided by the aggregator who is providing the mechanism by which people discover each other um, and and basically matching the supply and the demand, right? Or the creator and the consumer uh, mm-hmm. in some context. And so, yeah, if that's the case, that the hard problem is not in the creation of the content, but in the distribution of the content, then I think it's natural just sort of by economic law, so to speak, that the money will end up pooling with the aggregator. Yeah. And then so I guess like if if that is actually the case, then I would say that the this alternative business model for the internet needs to be paired with an implicit distribution mechanism it's almost as if like the internet needs to have some kind of search built into its protocol or Mm -hmm. browsing built into its protocol rather than as a service provided by a private company of some sort yeah Um, right when you say browsing you mean like discovery yeah, like however it works, it would had to, it would have to be built into the protocol. I'm not exactly sure how that would right, work, right. but like if it was or governed by like a nonprofit governing it and like I can or something like I don't I don't even know. Is that the significantly harder hardest part? It might be, but then what of the content? Right, like if there's no content to distribute, then there's no need for an aggregator to provide the matching, and so it does seem weird to me that we've fallen into this version of monetization on the internet in which the platforms all the value is attributed to the platforms and then creators are scrambling to find ways to capture some of the that value by providing some value added courses or maybe a subscription only patreon where they provide some others value added insights like it seems like they're kind of getting shortchanged and they're trying to figure out like how to make some money out of this yeah, and I, I think that that's the case for now. But as people's jobs to do change, that'll shift the balance of like whether you want bundling or unbundling there. And so I, I don't know what that new job to be is go- going to be, um, job to be done is going to be. But once that shifts, which it usually does, because like these, whatever solution that people come up with ends up being too good that there's 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 room for for it to break out again so uh, uh, yeah i don't know i I think that there's a case Uh, so this is all to say that i think that xanadu is is right in providing some sort of built-in payments or like unit economics to work out like how to pay for content but I, I think some of the things that it is missing is some of the stuff that we just mentioned, like how how will it prevent like aggregation of things into the same place? Because as we've had experience on the internet before, like a lot of the hard problem of the supply chain of information is in the distribution, not necessarily in the content creation. Yeah, and... In the successful cases of hypermedia that we've mentioned, such as Twitter threads as well as TikTok, a lot of the reason why they're successful is because they're on these centralized platforms. Because mm-hmm. then you have the persistence of data. You don't have to worry about somebody's server going down and then your TikTok clip is 
no longer accessible. Like the the TikTok is providing a service there, which is the archival of this content, and then uh, also the discovery of this content. I think nobody is going to assemble hypermedia if they have to kind of hunt around for who's out there and what are they creating and what not. Like we mentioned, you know, in the lead in to the description of TikTok is that it has this algorithmic feed which surfaces information or content that you might want to see according to your interests. And I think that is, is the driving engine that fuels the hypermedia because people discover something in their feed and then they react to it or they, they add on to it. If they had to go and search for it manually themselves, nobody's going to put in that effort. The, the whole premise of hypermedia then falls apart. Yeah, at least not today. Maybe with... Uh... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe with GPT-3 that's running on a server that can continuously search for interesting things and aggregate it, and it's working as part of a protocol. And so maybe you could have something where people are running these things that are searching for more interesting things around the web as a way to aggregate as part of the discovery mechanism. And then when people go and visit the links that their aggregator put together then they get a cut sort of thing. And so that's the way right. that you incentivize it in, in a way that's not in a centralized entity. So that sort of thing is super hard to set up and hard to stabilize. And so I yeah. don't see anybody doing it soon, but I do, I can draw analogies from how that might be possible. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to imagine even like what, just from the user interface perspective, like what does it mean to buy into this, you know, these agents that are scouring the web and, and finding content. I think it's, it's, it's not something that is within reach just yet. Like we can talk about it, but I think that. It's uh, our very own Xanadu. It's our very own Xanadu. <laughs> like we have no idea what like it's going to take to get to this. Uh, so all I'm saying there is just that the in order for alternative business model, like Xanadu proposes to work Probably the discovery and the search and the engine of discovery needs to be be built into the protocol. And one mm -hmm. way to do that takes analogy from some examples in crypto in which individual actors are incentivized to play that part in the system. That that's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that makes sense. Um, now the the details are left as exercise too. Right <laughs> for for our startup future startup billionaires. Yeah, exactly. Means, right. <laughs> so so I think that you know we can go on and on about all the different minutia of Xanadu and all the mm -hmm. different effects that they have, but I think those are the main ones: hypermedia and then alternative business models. Those are themselves foundational. Even succeeding on one of those. Uh, is is a huge success, and I think it it speaks to how uh, massive the vision of Xanadu is. That that's just those are only like two bullet points of the seventeen uh, original rules of Xanadu that Ted Nelson prescribed, and there are several <laughs> other ones that right. you could. We'll like, put in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and and each of those bullet points is basically a research idea or potential startup or something uh and i think ted nelson was trying to solve the, solve all of them and so so maybe we can pivot then to the next part we usually talk about how can we get there but i think in this case um uh, we can talk about why didn't xanadu get there why didn't it take <laughs> off uh and, and then we can think about how can we kind of take the ball and run with it? How can we take up the mantle of some of these ideas that are still uh, valuable in Xanadu and then make them happen? But yeah, let's let's go with the first part first. What do you think were the biggest obstacles to Xanadu kind of languishing? Mm, I mean, I, I can see in reading some of the materials from Ted Nelson's own YouTube videos to the infamous article from 1995 and, and some of the more recent interviews with Ted Nelson that uh, I think there's a lot of stuff in there and it tried to do it at a time when some of the pieces were missing. And I think that is one problem. Hmm. Another problem is because this vision was so lofty, it attracted people that did not have the instinct to tie it to 
the near-term problems of today. You have to cater to the needs of people today if you ever have a hope of trying to bring it to to the idealized version that you were able to foresee, right? Um, and so there's so many instances of that. I, I don't know, what's a common one? Uh, one of the inventors of Java thought that it was a success because he managed to drag a whole generation of C++ programmers halfway to Lisp. Um, and it took a long, long time. I mean, PG is right. Uh, if he's ever wrong about anything, he's right about this, right? <laughs> like you yeah. just need to put things out and then just keep iterating. And it might suck and it would be a blow to your ego or people like don't use it the way you perceive that they should or they don't use it at all but like if anything you need to like get something out there quickly and iterate otherwise you could be the next Ted Nelson for better or for worse right right yeah yeah it's it's interesting because you have to meet you have to meet people where they are you have to meet the market yeah. where where the users are and then you have to meet technology where it is like you can't if you're too ahead of your time it's the same thing as being wrong right like that's the that's a uh, common trope in silicon valley trope. yeah 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 and and i think that this that both of those uh, were definitely the case with xanadu in that ted nelson himself admits that not only forget the user forget the end user the general population when he started Xanadu, other computer scientists who were at the top of their field didn't get it because uh, I think at that time, uh, computing was a very academic thing. People were reviewing uh, computers more as machines that are uh, number crunching machines, maybe for use in military or industrial purposes. And I think especially in the 60s, uh, Ted Nelson was thinking about xanadu as a type of literature it was this like kind of um mm -hmm. you know, humanities based a uh, view of computing which i think was it was didn't align with the people who had the skills the builders i think he wasn't able to build a coalition of people who were willing to work with him and advance his ideas i think that was one of the uh, unfortunate aspects as well is that Ted Nelson himself is not a computer scientist uh, or, or programmer. He describes himself as such. Like he, and so I think in order to really take this idea and make it in, in uh, bring it to fruition, you do need to build alliances, right? And, and unfortunately, I think that was one of the. Or the, the I mean, the the recent common Silicon Valley advice for non technical founders is to learn how to program. And if you right. can I mean, if you at least get the basic thing out, you'll be able to find somebody else that and so maybe maybe that would have helped him in the long run. I mean, he's had a long time. Um yeah. but he decided as far as I know, he doesn't really write programs. So Yeah, all the yeah, demos, uh there have been like four or five demos of Xanadu over the decades and all of those, it seems like, were written by some other developer who was helping out Ted Nelson or working with yeah, Ted Nelson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, like, yeah, you get your first shitty thing out, and then you, uh, I guess nothing, nothing, uh, nothing motivates a developer than somebody who's wrong. I guess there's that common trope of how to get help on the internet, right? From from developers or other nerds you, you say hey i think the answer to this and then just say something blatantly wrong and somebody will inevitably come in to correct you and there you have your answer yeah yeah exactly yeah and i, I think the other part is meeting technology where it is i think that xanadu was positioned as a competitor to the world wide web and initially, in, right. in, not, initially, yeah. not anymore, but initially, and I think for a long time, they really resisted. And I think it, like, I think this is where you're going. Like, it mm -hmm. did them a disservice to yeah. try to not leverage themselves on top of something that is already hugely popular. And you know, as much as it sucks, like, but you could build on top of that, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And and it had the usage. It at least introduced people to the concept of links, which, okay, you can derisively call them jump links. They're a lesser form of link, and, and there's much more that you could do with hypertext. But that's where the users are, right? Like, that's the... The World Wide Web was people's entry point to at least even the concept of these interlinked documents. And so I think that if, um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but but maybe if they had realized, okay, this web thing is taking off, and rather than trying to fight it, build a overlay layer, a Xanadu overlay on top of the web, then that could be... Uh, that could have been a vector by which they succeeded. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. In order for anything to materialize as a thing in human culture, the rubber has to meet the road, right? It has to be 10 times better along some dimension that people with a new job to be done needs to have. And then the unit economics has to work out and you have to have the right people pushing it along. I mean, I, I guess like this is you and I, I, I'm preaching to the choir with you, right? Because like, this is the sort of the typical stuff that people talk about in startups. And I guess there's a reason why they talk about that because it's just kind of the mechanism in which things get adopted in, in our current society. I, I mean, mm-hmm. and it's hard for me to imagine it being any other way just because it's all I know, but yeah. th- that that's kind of how, how things are at the moment. Like, even though we attribute various things for why it failed, I mean, given that we're too young <laughs> to have seen it firsthand, um, I would say I do also recognize that even if you had the vision and you had the technical chops, like Douglas Engelbart did, like you still may not make it, right? Like he yep. actually had a le- uh, lab and then after his mother of all demos, he had his legs swept out from under, under him and then he spent the rest of his time like trying to get back to a point where he had what he had. And I think that's a whole other story altogether. But like mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of things that probably have to align, not just the vision and the technical. Like, I don't want to be seem like we were, were telling Ted Nelson that all he had to do was learn how to program <laughs> and it would have worked, right? That That's certainly right. not the case. Yeah. Um, but, but I think, I think there, there are certain things where, where um, in, in all of the reasons I, I didn't hear a lot about how this would meet the real world. Because I, I think Ted Nelson, when he introduced hypermedia, oh, like electronic documents, they shouldn't be like paper. It shouldn't force you into like linear thinking. Like he's right in that there's no technical reason why electronic documents shouldn't be nonlinear. But I suspect that he never stopped to ask if there was like an anthropological reason why they should. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. For me, I think if you follow like PG's school of thought on writing, he's like the best way to learn how to uh, write or think is to write or that there's so few good writing because writing is thinking and most people are bad at thinking. (laughs) So Mm, if you ascribe to that, like I I think the, the, the linearization of thought on paper is the same thing as what like a forge does to metal. It like hardens and sharpens it so that it's more clear and transmissible to other humans and so when you have a notebook of links that's like a network of ideas it's an unruly mass usually unrefined thoughts and ideas and this is effectively what hypertext is and so like all the notebooks that i've ever seen on the web are kind of like that like they're not like things that are digestible to me it's fun to kind of traverse around and it has more meaning for the person that that did it in the same way that if you were to look at my notes you're like what is this <laughs> i think the that that's the part that that we're getting at that there's there's other elements besides the vision like you have to have the vision you have to have the technical chops you have to but i think what was missing was like how the rubber met the road in real life in terms of what people would use it for and what the unit economics would be and among other things. Yeah. And I think we're seeing some aspect of this play out with 
um, with these tools for thought that have backlinks uh, and things like um, like Rome Research, where now that people have built this sort of nest of, you could call it hypermedia, right? You, you this nest of, yeah, of notes. It literally is hypermedia. Yeah. 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 Um, so. I think people have this now, and then I think now there's a lot of discussion I see on on Twitter and other places where people are like, "Well, what do we do with this thing?" Right? Like, uh, and, well, you're and, supposed to review it and then write blog posts from your insights. Yeah, exactly. But it takes <laughs> but, discipline to do that, and, and and so it's it's good that people are having this discussion, and and they wouldn't be able to get to this this more fine grained discussion of okay, well, now we have this. What do we do with this? Is this truly useful and uh, accomplishing our goals? They wouldn't be able to have that type of introspection if they weren't able to get that first uh, cycle in, right? That first iteration of yeah. just have the thing exist. Uh, yeah, definitely. And like hypermedia is something that people need to experience in order to really understand so that they can ask these other questions, right? Because when you describe it to people, for people who've never seen it, it just doesn't make any sense. Like uh, I think there is a famous interview with ted nelson by some journalist way back when and he just did not get <laughs> hypermedia or hypertext and right. ted nelson was just beside himself and we'll link to it in the show notes but yeah it's you're definitely right about that yeah so so yeah i i wish that there was just like a demo that people could just get a sense of what it felt like even if it was just a toy example of maybe I don't know, 10 web pages or, or 10 yeah. pages and, and then you can click around and then you get a sense of, oh, this is useful. Oh, it's not that useful in this way. We're referring to all of these ideas like a lean startup and minimum viable product and, and Paul Graham and all this stuff, which, you know, is a type of social technology, like the just the concept mm-hmm. of putting things out there and seeing how it works is a basically a social construct that people really didn't converge on until much much later and so yeah it's a cultural thing i guess once again show notes um maggie appleton has an article about tools for thoughts where instead of tools for thought as computational objects they're actually like cultural uh transmissions between people their cultural mm. practices between people and so yeah. this may be one of those things where like culturally like just mvp lean startup putting things out there i don't know move fast and break things all the typical stuff that we think of as being tropes in silicon valley actually are cultural practices that had to be be developed and what you're saying is like maybe this sort of thing took their time to do so and um would have helped a project like Xandu, but it just wasn't available to them in the time that they were doing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I stole your punchline. No, 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 and, no. That, that... <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but, uh, go on. And so I want to say on the positive note of things, um, like where, where Xanadu didn't fail are the things that help technologists break out of what they take for granted and assume to be like, that was Mm. the most valuable sorts of things I took from reading Ted Nelson and his writings and his YouTube videos, because one of the things that we take for granted and I keep referencing water and I guess that's a show note to David Foster Wallace's like, what is water? I think. Yeah. And so one of the things is that our world is shaped by databases. And one of the ways is that we have rigid forms in which we fill out either at the DMV or the doctor's office in which we have to fit ourselves into those boxes. And because we're so used to it, we don't really give it another thought. But like many people don't have middle names and yet we have Mm -hmm. like a box for middle name or middle initial. And, you know, there's plenty of people with no last name or no, no first name. Yep. And they create problems in systems. And that's just to say that the world is kind of a complicated and messy place and we've tried to fit in into the box that conforms to how computers can best process them. And so we as technologists oftentimes 
create structure where it doesn't necessarily belong. Hmm. And so this can manifest in usability problems. So for example, in a lot of task management uh, and project management software I've used, you often had to create a project or a categorization for your tasks before you create that task. Because, you know, how would you know what record to link it to? Otherwise, it's like an orphan thing, right? Yeah, right. But from the user perspective, that may be putting the cart bef- before the horse. Because like I mentioned before, in my note-taking experience, you may not know where this thing belongs until you've had a couple examples already. If there was more flexibility in our tools, then we might be able to be better able to handle the complexities of the world instead of like putting things in rigidity where they are. And mm-hmm. so going back to Xanadu and Ted Nelson, I think being able to see that rigidity is is one of the things that he is best able to point out. And that's one of the better values that I've gotten out of him because otherwise, like we just kind of take it as it is. Yeah. And I think that uh, it's a good call out that a lot of the reason why we have these rigid structures uh, and rigid workflows in our software tools is because of the limitations of the the underlying data structures uh, that we're using. If you're using a database, especially if you're using a relational database, well, it has a fixed schema. You have to populate the data according to uh, the the schema and create a row, a project row, uh, which has, you know, some one to many references to tasks or something. And so then the mm-hmm. tool forces you into that model. Uh, whereas, if you have a more fluid data structure, which Xanadu has many, many interesting data structures, which they were inventing because I think at that time that they were coming up with Xanadu, there weren't data structures that supported this sort of um, interweaved data and uh, and whatnot. Uh, but assuming you have those data structures, then then you can have a much more fluid way of creating information and, co- and coalescing it because a lot of the time, you don't realize the shape of something until you have a few instances of it, right? Yeah, and then, yeah. Uh, and then you so structure emerges and you say, oh, okay, now I'm collecting these together and we can organize it this way. Or even you can organize it in multiple ways, right? You can have multiple views of the same data, um, which maybe Xanadu could uh, also afford by transcluding things differently and rendering them differently. Yeah, so I think that that's in- interesting. There are some new software tools that are uh, coming along, like uh, especially in the tools for thought and task management mm-hmm. space, which are taking a less rigid approach. Yeah, but it's yeah. a good it's a good point that like even until maybe a decade ago, that wasn't the case. Like the default was you you organize your data uh, in things like folders first and then yeah. yeah folders first and then you figure out the contents but maybe we should reverse that content first and then organization later yeah yeah i, I definitely think that's the case right so having discussed why xanadu didn't take off i do want to call out i think a few of the projects which could push forward the idea of uh, xanadu the vision of Xanadu. I'm not holding my breath and I'm not saying anybody should hold their breath <laughs> that Xanadu itself will manifest anytime soon. And, and, you know, unfortunately Ted Nelson is 85 years old. So I think that, uh, and in his YouTube videos, his most recent YouTube videos, he is well aware that Xanadu will probably not be finished in his lifetime if ever. And so what he's been doing more recently has been to document some of the foundational elements of the vision of Xanadu in hopes that somebody will push that forward. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it will happen under the banner of Xanadu, but I, uh, there are some other projects that are advancing the concept. So one interesting project I want to call out that is related to maybe the idea of transclusion uh, is this uh, project called the Block Protocol, which is trying mm-hmm. to create like these universal embeddable elements of data. Uh, so you oh. can, um, like, is 
Maggie Appleton working on that, or she's she was, working on she, something different? She she was working on that and has switched uh, to a different project, but um, but yeah, still kind of taking that. that block block idea. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Exactly. Because like D- David Weiner, uh, the I think he's the self proclaimed inventor of RSS. Like his blog has links to every paragraph that he writes on his blog, and so uh-huh. I often thought that he treated like every bits of his blog as a tweet but i guess you could say that it's a block as well and so you see this kind of block protocol notion in notion Mm -hmm. allow me to introduce (laughs) myself yeah that's odd so uh but yeah 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 that this all ties together i guess is what i'm Mm -hmm. saying yeah, yeah. So, so this is a new. It's a it's a transclusion for the modern world, right? So you can mm-hmm. not only transclude um, text, but uh, also have these interoperable. Like, uh, for example, you can have like a to do list block, and mm-hmm. and that can appear in multiple apps, and they can reference right. that same that right. same to do list in different right. contexts. Uh, right. So that so that's one. Um, I think in terms of the bi directional linking aspect of things. And also just the idea that you can have fluid views, content first, organization second, uh, Rome research. And there there are a few successors to Rome's research. I think Tana mm-hmm. is one that people have been excited about, which are mm-hmm. for personal knowledge management. Uh, these are tools that use a lot of these concepts. And then I think there's increasing interest from people who are using tools like Rome research and Tana to create a network of ideas and so a protocol in which everybody maintains their own notes but then are able to reference each other's notes and reference each other's work uh, there's an interesting um uh, interesting project called the new sphere which mm, is trying yes. to do this uh By is, gordon brandon i believe yeah and we'll, we'll put it we'll put it in the in the notes as well right um, but yeah, I think as as people are now creating their own little nests of information uh, as a sort of single player game, people are interested in making that multiplayer. And it's interesting to watch that play out because maybe that's the right way to create Xanadu all along is mm-hmm. make it sort of useful uh, for in the, the individual now. in right. the now. And then you can network it later. It's this, Chris Dixon has this uh, this trope uh, or this phrase that's become a trope called "come for the tool, stay for the network," mm-hmm. uh, yeah. which is uh, kind of playing out here. Uh, another cultural practice, I, I guess, cultural practice in the world of startups. Yeah, right. And, and we'll put it in the show notes as well. It's mm-hmm. an interesting concept. Um, so it's interesting to watch those emerge. And then I think, in terms of micropayments, I think it's still pretty far out, but I have been talking to a few people lately who are interested in. Bitcoin Lightning, the Lightning Network, as mm-hmm. a form of uh, payments on the web. We mentioned we have a, a, a video about it or an episode about it, so check that out. But I think that could also help advance the the vision of Xanadu. There, I, and those are just a select few. Like these are not necessarily endorsements. These are just a few that are, were on my radar as projects that pertained in some way to just a small portion of the vision of Xanadu. Yeah, yeah. Think of it as leads into your own obsessive research rabbit hole that you can walk down when you type Xanadu into the browser, and we're just helping you out a little here. Yeah is 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 uh, is our podcast a form of hypermedia? We've been creating our own little nest of self reference. Uh, oh yes, across- by all means, check out our other episodes. We do find that as we talk about different uh, uh, retro technologies as well as edge and fringe technologies that a lot of them point back to each other and uh, a lot of this stuff is connected or different viewpoints on the same ideas or different sides of the same coin whatever phrase that you want to make like we find that they're all related somehow in this nest of technology ideas so um so yeah definitely check out our other episodes yeah. So with that, I think we have covered that as best as we can. Uh, this is already quite a long episode, but definitely follow all the links. Uh, read about it yourself. I think this is a very, very interesting project that introduces some very, very foundational ideas. Uh, it, it, it introduced the concept of hypertext. It has 
a variety of ideas such as transclusion, uh, micropayments, and copyright, trans copyright, which are still unresolved today and might still come to fruition. Um, and so, yeah, with that, my optimism, I don't know if I'd call it, I, I think my optimism for the vision of Xanadu is super high. Uh, the, the Xanadu itself, uh, like I said, I don't know if it will come to fruition for Ted Nelson, and I do feel a little sad about that. But I think, I think overall, as I read about this, I think there is just something there. And I think if we, given some more time, uh, we'll see elements of Xanadu come uh, come to fruition. Not necessarily un- in name, but at least in spirit. Yeah, I think the uh, the vision of human augmented intellect is so alluring that it's lasted for what now seventy years, yeah. and I think it's partially because like we humans value our intellect as our distinguishing feature, and we want to amplify, double down on what we're already good at. It's just something alluring and seductive the idea that we might be able to augment our intellect to think unthinkable thoughts or to uh, get a handle on more complex problems and so i think that um i'm optimistic about that and our tools will continue to get better and better and uh, we'll figure out a lot of things and so maybe one day we'll have something that uh Ted Nelson envisioned uh, in the future. Yeah. So, uh, if you like this episode, like we mentioned, check out our other episodes where we talk about the other edges of technology and why they're interesting and what future they point to. Uh, so, check them out and also subscribe. Uh, like and subscribe. Comment about what you think about Xanadu. I'm very interested to hear what other takes are on it. Uh, and also check out our audio versions on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, and write us a review to bring other Techniamistas on board. Um, with that, this is Shri. And this is Will. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>